Good evening, distinguished panelists and attendees. Good afternoon on the West Coast, and welcome to Art Law, Warhol Foundation versus Goldsmith. My name is Jeff Prostowski. I'm a 3L and president of the Intellectual Property Law Association at RWU Law and an incoming IP litigation associate at Morgan Lewis and Bacchius in Boston. I'm pleased to announce that over 620 people pre-registered for this webinar from across the country. Thank you all for being here. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Copyright Society, especially Dr. Bamathy Vizwanathan, who I had the pleasure of studying copyright with this semester, as well as uh, Kate, Jen, Naomi, Casey, and Bobby. I'd also like to thank the board of uh, IPLA, Morgan, Irving, Christopher, Ishita, and Lindsay, as well as our faculty advisor, Professor Nikki Kukas. And thank you to Polina Volfovich for the beautiful poster. Tonight's webinar will be recorded, and if you would like a copy of the recording, please email me at ipla at g.rwu.edu. Feel free to post your questions in the Q&A during the panel and either one of the panelists will answer your query during the talk or we will try to cover the question in the Q&A segment afterwards. So let's begin. Professor Lessig said that fair use in America simply means the right to hire a lawyer. William Paul Patry wrote that regrettably the understanding of derivative works is fast approaching incomprehensibility. The issue in this case is whether Warhol's silkscreen print of prints was a transformative fair use under the copyright law, such that despite allegedly infringing upon the rights of the photographer Lynn Goldsmith by copying expressive portions of her photograph, Warhol's work was lawful because a transformative use with a new meaning or message furthers the purpose of copyright law, promoting creative expression for the public good. But the courts are split on the test for what exactly makes for a transformative use. The district court thought it was transformative because it had a new meaning or message, commenting on modern society, but the circuit court disagreed and held that if the work was recognizably derived from the original, it cannot be transformative. Supreme Court held lively oral arguments last week, and now the fate of how much an artist can legally borrow from a prior work is in the hands of the Supreme Court. All right, cue slides. Here we go. All right, we'll start there. Depicted is the original photo of Prince by Lynn Goldsmith next to Warhol's purple prints. And Warhol was commissioned by Vanity Fair magazine in 1984 to use this photo as an artist reference to make a new work of art to illustrate the article, Purple Fane, an appreciation of Prince at the height of his powers that quotes, escape from Prince is no longer possible. Finally, he has arrived. Warhol died in 1987, Prince died in 2016. The Warhol Foundation was approached by Condé Nast in 2016 to use another piece from the Prince series for a tribute issue to Prince. They paid over $10,000 to use orange prints. It turns out that Warhol made two pencil drawings and 13 silkscreen paintings along with the purple prints he submitted to Vanity Fair. Goldsmith saw the cover for the Condé Nast article and sued the Warhol Foundation for copyright infringement. The Warhol Foundation argues fair use. The question presented to the Supreme Court is what is the proper test for whether a work is transformative under the first factor of the Copyright Act's fair use doctrine? Cut slideshow. There we go. First panelist is Professor Jessica Lippmann. Professor Lippmann, a past trustee of the Copyright Society, teaches copyright law at the University of Michigan Law School and is currently an advisor for the American Law Institute's restatement of copyright. Professor Lippmann, some say fair use has gotten too big and transformation is the essence of the derivative work right. Is that a rhetorical trick? And if the concept of the defendant adding quantitatively or qualitatively to the plaintiff's work is legitimate, should Judge Laval have picked a different word other than transformative? So some always say that fair use has gotten too big. I've been teaching for 38 years, which makes me sort of in the middle uh, of this group. And I've never known a year when some people haven't said fair use has gotten too big. Um, we've had the transformative use test uh, since the Campbell case in 1994. And I think courts have without question uh, fallen into the completely understandable error of, of feeling that whether a use is transformative is the name of the game, is the ball game. So they decide this is a fair use or this isn't a fair use and proceed to reverse engineer this is transformative or it isn't transformative. Um, it is always going to be the case that a fair use is going so 
it's always the case that a fair use is otherwise going to be an infringement of copyright. So if you make a derivative work, Yes, transformation is the essence of making a derivative work, but we don't even get to fair use until we've decided that without fair use, this work would be infringing. Although I think the district court in this case jumped the gun and said, I don't need to decide if this is going to be infringing. I'll just decide it's fair use anyway, which set us up for the Second Circuit, deciding without looking at any of the evidence of whether the works were substantially similar, that this was nonetheless substantially similar as a matter of law. So it would be really nice if the Supreme Court gave us a helpful test, said, this is what we mean by transformative, or said, you doofuses, we never meant that transformative is it, that if it's not transformative, it's not fair. We were talking about transformative being a particular kind of fair use. And either of those would be super helpful. Something that I think would not be helpful is the kind of opinions we've gotten used to receiving in Aereo, uh, in, in Google, I think, where the court says, you know, we're not going to tell you about the test. We're not going to give you any general principles. We're going to give you nothing that is useful for other cases. But we know it when we see it and when we look at this. This one is transformative, even though we can't tell you how it would apply to anything else. That will settle this case one way or the other, but it won't help the uh, lower courts with, I think, their confusion over whether something has to be transformative for the use to be fair, and if so, what transformative means. Great. And, you know, a lurking issue is uh, what, what parts of Goldsmith's photograph are protectable expression? You know, there are many photographers in the audience tonight. What, what parts of a photograph does copyright law protect? And will the Supreme Court tell us more in this opinion? I think it probably can't tell us more in this opinion, which is too bad. Uh, photographs have been protected by copyright for more than 100 years, and we haven't settled what parts of a photograph are indeed protected by copyright, what are the photographer's choices or a result of the photographer's manipulation of the tools that she's able to use, and what is Prince's face. Um, the district court was invited to decide that, had all sorts of evidence from both sides about that, and didn't go there because that's in some ways really hard. Um, the record below talks a lot about what Warhol changed. There are disagreements about that in the record below, but it has to be the case. I mean, in today's world, we all use photographs for many things. And if we had a clearer, crisper sense of what parts of a photograph are protected by copyright and what are pre-existing reality that other people can use, that would both give photographers more certainty in deciding how to license and how to enforce their copyrights and give the rest of the world more certainty in trying to figure out what we can do with photographs of reality. I mean, none of us, I've never seen, I never saw prints in person. My only experience of prints is via photographs and I expect that's true of most of us. How about uh, the, I, I've read in some opinions that the, the, the they were saying the face, the, the, is, is Prince's face, uh, copy, you know, his pose, is that copyrightable? Uh, no, I think his face and his pose don't belong to Goldsmith. I mean, a copyright postulist is only the expression that you add is covered by your copyright. And whoever created Prince's face and his expression uh, that's not, I think, the photographer. The problem is that the record before the Supreme Court procedurally doesn't really give the court a clear opportunity to tell us what aspects of Goldsmith's photograph are protected by her copyright, because the petition for cert really raised only the transformativeness point. And so they would have to reach out beyond the briefs to read the record below, I think, to 
be able to address the copyrightability of photographs generally. And while that might be a very good thing for them to do, it's kind of unlikely, I think. The uh, people on the panel <laughs> who have in some ways more knowledge and experience with this may disagree with me and think that, no, that's something that's going to happen. Great. And uh, so just because you're the first panelist, if you wouldn't mind just walking us through, yeah, I, I've got here the uh, transformation rule here uh, as as explicated in, in one of the briefs. It says Campbell and Google establish a straightforward rule. A follow on work is transformative and has a different purpose and character under Section 1071 when it can reasonably be perceived to add something new by altering the first with new expression, meaning or message. And they're saying that's from Campbell and Google. So is okay so what is the problem with the second circuit's analysis did they apply this transformation rule what or, or were they doing something else like trying to put a big black sharpie over carry you well i think they were clearly trying to put a big black sharpie over carry you um and they weren't able to say you know carry you was a mistake we we uh uh don't believe that anymore they had to work within the confines of carry you I think, however, that what the test the Second Circuit adopted, which is if you can recognize the underlying source, it's not transformative, yeah. it would be disastrous if anyone took it seriously. Yeah. Um, so that can't be, uh, they clearly wanted to, to sort of send this back to the district court and say, Goldsmith wins, the foundation loses. And so here is a very firm, clear rule, but it's it will be a very hard rule to apply to all of the cases that uh, come up in the Second Circuit raising fair use. So uh, I hope they don't mean it. Wow. And I know that you just read 35 essays from your I copyright did. class <laughs> responding to the oral arguments from this case and predicting the outcome. What, 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 um, just what are your thoughts on the oral argument and maybe what do your students think? Well, so my students, understandably, uh, went with who did the most effective job in oral argument. And I think everyone would agree that Lisa Blatt slayed it. It was just wonderful. Um, so they're sure pretty much that the Supreme Court is going to affirm. Some of them perceived in the justices' questions a desire to look for a middle ground. And so they think that the SG's rule, which I personally, if idiosyncratically, think would be the worst of all worlds, is going to be the world that the court will go with. I think it's sort of while the SG's rule is superficially really appealing because it's the rule we apply to derivative works, which is each use of a derivative work needs permission or a license or a privilege from the underlying work. In fair use, the we don't have an initial negotiation between the purported fair user and the author of the underlying work. So they can't work that out at the front end. They can't say, hey, I want to make a Broadway musical based on hairspray. Let's figure out how we're going to divide up the money the high schools pay to Musical Theater International when they do a production, because there isn't that initial negotiation. And that means that if every use of a purported fair using work, every use of critical commentary, every use of a parody, every use of a scholarly analysis of Warhol's art is going to need a separate analysis or license, the chilling effect of that and the transaction costs just seem to me uh, to be to just dwarf uh, the rest of the world. If I tell my local bookstore, you can't carry this book that analyzes Warhol's art unless you go and get permission from the photographers who licensed his work in the first instance, you know, the bookstore is going to say, fine, I'm not going to carry the book. That's easy. So I very much worry about 
uh, that rule, but several of my students have suggested that's going to be the rule the Supreme Court adopts. Wow. So let's go to the Q&A and see here. Um, we've got a question from Deborah Price asking if you could kind of define and explicate more about uh, fair use and perhaps its purpose, since you are, again, the first panelist and we're talking about fair use here. Please define fair use. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. I mean, this takes me two weeks in, in class. Um, so there are various uses that the law has decided while they may reproduce or adapt or distribute copies of or publicly perform or display some portions of protected underlying expression, we're going to allow them anyway. And we're going to allow them anyway, based on the purpose they serve and based on whether or not they harm the market for the underlying work. So if in order to write a review of a book, I need the permission of the author of the book, because I'm going to be duplicating some of the expression, I'm going to quote, I'm going to summarize the plot, then the author of the book will say, well, if it's a good review, I'll give you permission. And if it's a bad review, I won't. And since we want candid reviews, we just go ahead and say, yeah, that's OK. Similarly, parodies are commonly considered to be fair use when they're criticizing the underlying work they're parodying, because Again, if we needed permission, we wouldn't have them. But they're uses that uh, use the work for a good purpose, that don't harm the copyright owner too much, and do help uh, readers and listeners and viewers a lot. And it's always been a sort of uh, squishy rule uh where we're balancing the various interests and saying well you know this use is fair and this use is not fair um best i can do i think in you know uh 90 seconds thank you, thank you so much professor Libin. And, and feel free now that we're moving on to our next panelist to answer some of these q a questions if you want to type out any answers okay so okay. next up we have uh jordana rubel Jordana works on a wide range of legal matters within the U.S. Copyright Office, including advising the Department of Justice on litigation matters and providing guidance to departments within the Copyright Office. Jordana can join the Copyright Office in 2018 after more than 10 years as a litigator in private practice, where she represented clients on copyright, trademark, false advertising, and trade secret matters. She clerked for David Hamilton, now on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, when he was a district court judge in the Southern District of Indiana. Jordana. Welcome to the panel. First question for you. How does a government amicus brief get written? Does the Copyright Office work directly with the Justice Department or how does the process work? I'm sure some of our attendees would love to know. Um, sure, and I'm happy to talk about this. This is actually one of my favorite parts of my job. Um, and and uh, before I start, just thanks very much for having me and allowing me to uh, do my best to represent the government's perspective in this case. Um, uh, so when the Supreme Court decides that it will grant cert in a case, and sometimes even uh, if they're seeking the Solicitor General's views before deciding uh, whether uh, to grant cert, um, there's kind of a frenzy of activity on the government side. Um, the Department of Justice will decide who's going to be staffing the case from their side, and they will send an email out to all the Office of General Counsels in any uh, agency or quasi agency that might have an interest in the case. So it really depends um, what type of case it is and what kind of issues it brings up. Here, we were squarely in the copyright world and we're not really dealing with a doctrine that has, you know, statutory language that's similar to um, other statutes that might impact um, totally different agencies. Uh, but there still may be interest from other agencies like the Department of Commerce because the decision might have an impact on um, the United States government's commercial interests. Certainly the US Patent and Trademark Office has a whole copyright division. So they have an interest in this case um, uh, and, and others as well. So the, the email goes out saying, you know, we're interested in getting uh, agencies views on this case. Um, and each of the agencies puts together a memorandum. Um, 
we also have an opportunity if the parties are interested in meeting with us um, and kind of pitching their side or their position. Um, so it's an interesting opportunity to hear what their arguments are. Sometimes for them, I think it's an interesting opportunity maybe to test out different arguments and see how the government responds to those. Uh, and everybody then uh, hands in their memoranda. The Department of Justice is tasked with sort of uh, putting those together and writing up its version of um, a brief. And then the uh, government um, representatives who are interested in the case then have another chance to meet with the parties and they make a more official presentation. The Office of the, List of the Solicitor General General really runs that part of the um, uh, interaction with the parties. It's a really interesting day. Uh, it usually, um, it typically has been in person. We're in a big conference room. You know, petitioner comes in with um, their group of lawyers. Then we ask a lot of questions. Uh, they leave. The respondent comes in with their group of lawyers. We ask a lot of questions, they leave, and then just the government folks are left sitting in the room hashing out, which way do we think we wanna come down here? Uh, and then the Office of the Solicitor General really takes the lead in drafting what the final brief looks like. Of course, in a case like this, that's primarily copyright, the Copyright Office consults with them, um, answers a lot of questions, participates in the moots before the oral argument. Um, and generally tries to make sure that we're coming up with a position that everybody can live with and um, and and get behind. Wow. So is your position the same as respondents? And if not, how's it different? So in many respects, the government um, does have the same position as the respondents here. Um, and I can kind of kind of try to go through uh, in what ways um, I think we're coming at this from the same perspective. The first is, and this relates to um, one of the points Professor Littman was making previously. The first is we really do think it is important to focus on the specific use at issue, at issue here, which we think is the commercial licensing of that orange prints not the creation of the works here. Um, and actually, um, you know, I, I think we believe that um, that is the current state of the law, that that wouldn't be a change um, from what the current state of the law is. Uh, so that's number one. We think the, the real issue here is whether um, the commercial licensing of orange prints by the Andy Warhol Foundation was fair use. And within that, the first factor being, um, number one, it's not uh, disputed here that it was commercial. So the disputed piece is, was it transformative? Um, we also agree with the respondent that the meaning or message test that the petitioner is advocating for, uh, we don't think that is a fair characterization of the rule from Campbell. Um, we do note, of course, that the words meaning or message do appear in Campbell. Um, but what we actually believe is um, that you really need to focus on the statutory text, which is focusing on the purpose and the character of the use. And that here, the purpose of the use was to illustrate an article. Um, and that is the same as the purpose of the original uh, photograph, which was to serve uh, which was, you know, to illustrate Prince as an artist um, and which was licensed by Goldsmith herself to be used um, as an artist reference for an article discussing Prince. So we think that, you know, despite the addition of material uh, to uh, in, in the secondary work, we think they ultimately have identical purposes and that the inquiry really ends there. Now, how do you respond to uh, uh, to to this from, from one of the briefs? It said that actually the panel erred in considering the purpose of the prints at far too high a level of generality. The panel's observation that both works are portraits of prints ignores what each work says through its respective portrayal. Whereas Goldsmith displayed Prince's unique human identity, Warhol depicted Prince to reflect back to the viewer his skewed and dehumanizing view of celebrity. The two works thus had different purposes because they conveyed different meanings and messages. 
I mean, I, I think um, that's exactly the kind of analysis we're trying to get away from um, <laughs> uh, because it's really hard to determine what was an artist's intent either at the moment or retrospectively, particularly when the artist who created the work hasn't been alive during the course of this litigation. So I think you know, the danger of this kind of test or among the dangers of this kind of test is putting a judge in a position where he or she has to determine what was the intent of this artist. And I, you know, I'm not sure practically how that is supposed to work. Is this supposed to be a battle of the art experts where you know this person, this art historian gets on the bench and argues, well, I believe based on my understanding of Warhol's art that his intent must have been this. Um, and then a different art historian gets up and says something different. Or can we look at the facts in this case and say, this was a commissioned work. He was illustrating prints for use to illustrate an article about prints. And that was his intent here. So I, I think if, if we try to get, uh, if we make this an entirely subjective um, inquiry, I, I'm not sure how that is supposed to work out uh, practically in the courtroom. Sure. And I'm just curious, you know, in oral argument at the end, they, the justices were trying to clarify with the government about what the exact standard should be. Is it necessary and useful, necessary and highly useful? What ex is it exactly? And I just would love for your kind of thoughts on um, what that is about. Um, yes, good question. Um, so I actually, um, that was not my favorite part of the oral argument, just speaking as myself, uh, not uh, not on behalf of the government. But I, I think um, some of the nuance in the government's brief was a little bit lost um, when we got to that point in the oral argument. Um, and I'll try to explain what I mean by that. In the um, amicus brief that we submitted, we tried to explain that, um, and I think everyone will agree to this point, um, fair use is a very context specific inquiry. Um, we, we were not trying to um, address every possible way a work can be considered transformative. Um, there's a long footnote in our brief um, that tries to explicitly say that. Um, I, I think what we were trying to say is that in certain circumstances, it will be clear that the purpose of the secondary work is different than the purpose of the original. For example, like in Campbell, when it was commentary on the original, when it was a parody. In those kinds of cases, it is necessary or at least helpful or very helpful or whatever kind of uh, adverb you wanna add in there for um, the secondary user to be able to copy portions of the first because they won't be able to make their own expression as clearly without use of the original work. Um, but that's not the only circumstance in which it would be permissible or, or whether we think, or in which we think it would be transformative for somebody to use the original work. And I, I think that is in response to your previous question, that is one place where I think there was some daylight between our position and the respondents here. They argued in their brief that they did think it needed to be necessary to be considered transformative. Great. So this is again from one of the briefs says, there could be no meaning, the panel claimed that there could, this is quoting Second Circuit, the, the panel claimed that there could be no meaningful dispute that the overarching purpose and function of the two works at issue here is identical, not merely in the broad sense that they are created as works of visual art, but also in the narrow but essential sense that they are portraits of the same person. So is that something, because I know overarching purpose and function is going to come up later in the in the panel as well. Um, is that something that the government uh, um, you know, agrees with? Yeah, I mean, that's consistent with our view. I think here... Um, and I, I thought um, Justice um, Jackson made a good point about this in the oral argument. If you look at the other language in the uh, introductory um, portion of section 107, where um, the fair use defense is codified, the level of, um, you know, the, it discusses things like commentary, news reporting, research, 
um, it's a fairly high level at which we're looking at things. And if we look at this use from the same level, um, I think the use here is identical. And so if meaning or message is sufficient to establish a different purpose or character of the use, will just adding an Instagram filter be enough to meet the test? I think it could be. Um, you know, it won't take a Warhol anymore to uh, allow somebody to get up and say, you know, I did add a new meaning or message by introducing this purple color or this purple shading. Um, and I think that would be a huge detriment and danger to photographers um, and their copyrights and ability to uh, make a living. Great, thank you, Jordan. Let's let's look at the at the Q and A. I've got one here from Linda. It says, "What is oh well? It's just a it's just asking for a summary here. What is the SG's proposed rule?" Um, well, I think I think for the most part, we think that Campbell is actually working. Um, I don't think we're advocating for a new rule here, um, uh, with the one caveat that. Um, I think as Prof Professor Littman also noted, um, transformative use has kind of become synonymous in some courts eyes with a finding of fair use. And we do think it would be great if we could get a clarification that all four um, factors need to be considered and some may be more important than others in different contexts, but certainly um, the transformativeness inquiry should not um, outweigh any of the others. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jordana. And now we will move on to Professor Sandra Astars. Professor Astar is a previous trustee of the Copyright Society, is a clinical professor at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School. She is also a fellow for the Copyright Research and Policy and a senior scholar at the school's Center for Intellectual Property and Innovation Policy. Professor Astars leads the law school's art and entertainment Adv advocacy program and has been an industry advisor to the Department of Commerce on IP implications for international trade negotiations. Prior to joining Scalia Law, Professor Astars was the CEO um, of the Copyright Alliance, and she also previously served as vice president and associate general counsel at Time Warner Inc. and began her legal career in private, legal career in private practice at Wild Gottschall and Mangies. Professor Astars will be given the Meyer Memorial Lecture on November 16th on the lost art of substantial similarity, commentary on Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts v. Lynn Goldsmith. Perfect. So, Professor Astars, we've now heard arguments for Warhol and for Goldsmith. What is your position? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for organizing the panel and for having me. Oh, of course. Um, and uh, as you might uh, surmise from the uh, preview of my Meyer Lecture topic, I don't take a position for or against either artist here. Um, I don't think it's possible to do so on the issue of transformative fair use um, because the case has been presented in a way where the Supreme Court is being asked to answer an impossible question, um, a question where no foundation has been laid. Um, the Second Circuit and the Supreme Court uh, uh, are considering whether Andy Warhol's use of Goldsmith's photograph uh, in the Prince series was transformative fair use, but um, I think as Professor Littman also alluded to, um, the Southern District of New York refused to consider and rule on substantial similarity first, um, and the Second Circuit also brushed this aside when they had the opportunity to consider the issue. Um, and so there's been no basic assessment of infringement made. Um, Substantial similarity, in my view, is something that it's an investigation that provides the opportunity to make very important evidentiary findings about what is original um, and therefore protectable about both of the works at issue. And these kinds of findings are core and crucial for a later analysis of transformative fair use, if that is ultimately necessary. Um, I mean, to put it bluntly, how can you tell if something's been transformed if you don't know what it is to begin with? Well, in the oral argument, the justice is repeatedly asked if a change of color could produce a new meaning or message. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, well, again, I think the question um, was asked in the context of the transformative use inquiry um, and the uh, other questions that the justices asked 
uh, probing purpose and character of the works um, at issue also illustrate my point about the importance of the threshold inquiry of substantial similarity um, to gather more information about the works before jumping into a, a transformative use analysis. Um, I think there's this perception among uh, courts and among observers of courts that um, an infringement analysis is either uh, that like skipping over the infringement analysis is either somehow per procedurally efficient um, or that by simply assuming that infringement has occurred and moving on to the transformative use uh, inquiry, you're doing the uh, first artist a favor um, or you'll be able to move on and decide the case on some higher principles uh, without getting the judiciary's hands dirty um, and messing around with the messy business of understanding art, um, but that's wrong. Uh, the ultimate effect when you sidestep these evidentiary um, inquiries and refuse to engage with artwork to properly assess and understand it is that you're shifting what's really a factual dispute to the Supreme Court to decide um, in the guise of a debate over the proper standard of transformative use. Um, if you're looking to assess the facts, even about a contemporary artwork without a lot of obvious narrative meaning, um, it's much easier to do so on a factual um, evidentiary basis, work by work, um, than it is to come up with a broad um, globally applicable standard, like whether a change in color is um, signifying a change in meaning. Um, in the article that you referenced, um, I uh, talk about this hypothetical exhibit of um, solely made up of, of red squares. And this is actually something that um, the art philosopher um, Arthur Danto talks about in one of his, he uses it as an opening to one of his books. And he talks about, you know, you've got this uh, hypothetical exhibit of five, five, uh, five six works in this exhibit. Um, and imagine one of them is, um, he says, a clever little bit of Moscow landscape, and that one's titled Red Square. And then you've got another piece, which is a still life, and that's been painted by an embittered disciple of uh, Matisse. Uh, Matisse painted Harmony in Red. Um, so that one's a still life called Red Tablecloth. Um, there's a bunch of other works in the exhibit, but these two are a good enough example to make the point. Um, we can set aside for the moment the fact that the Copyright Office would never grant a um, registration for monochrome paintings, but the point is that applying a substantial similarity analysis, we could reach a conclusion that neither of these works is actually substantially similar to each other. They're, they represent completely different genres of painting. They com represent completely different um, ideas. The artists did not copy expression, protectable expression from one from the other. Uh, they demonstrated their own original expressive intent, intent in how they conceived of and um, executed their ideas on the canvas. Um, and we can do this without delving into and exploring the psyches of the artists and, you know, wondering whether there was some underlying meaning in the Red Square, whether it was some commentary on Soviet society or whether the red tablecloth was, you know, really like some commentary on dietary practices of, you know, people who are afraid of desserts or whatever. We can do this by simply looking at the titles and the times when these paintings were made and who the artists were. Um, and in terms of thinking about the originality of the works, we can trace, you know, what was done in terms of the expression of the works, how that was conveyed on the canvas by one, by the other, whether they had access to the works, whether they, uh, whether they were trying to um, convey the same same meaning. Um, this is not to say, by any stretch of the imagination, that a mere assertion of new meaning by one artist um, should suffice. I'm saying quite the opposite, that a substantial similarity analysis is where you do the rigorous work of examining evidence about works and coming to conclusions about, you know, what the facts are. So that when we get to, if we get to transformative fair use, we've got the evidentiary um, grounding from which to make the larger um, globally applicable standards. 
Thanks, Professor. And, you know, you mentioned examine evidence, properly engage with the artwork. Now, here's the second sec second circuit's language. The district judge should not assume the role of art critic and seek to ascertain the intent behind the meaning of the works at issue. Judges are typically unsuited to make aesthetic judgments, and such perceptions are inherently subjective. So is everyone wrong about Bleistein? If so, why? Yes, and I'm sorry that my friend Jordana is going to be angry with me on this one as well. Um, people often misinterpret the dangerous undertaking quote in Bleistein as a warning to judges to stay out of the art world and to stop, you know, uh, interpreting and analyzing and doing the evidentiary work that they should be doing when presented with two works of visual art. But if you read Bleistein, what Justice Holmes was saying in Bleistein was that you should not be making up or down judgments about copyright protection or copyright uh, enforcement about works based on your own personal tastes about the work. Um, he was not saying the judges should stay out of the art world. Justice Holmes, in fact, himself um, examined the work at issue, circus posters um, in that case, um, determined that this uh, type of work, low art, uh, the purpose and character of which, in fact, was to lure men to the circus by showing them the bare shoulders and fat legs of ballet dancers. They apparently had fat ballet dancers back then. <laughs> lure them to the circus with this. Um, but that yet this low art was, in fact, protectable as copyright, you know, copyrighted expression. So, uh, and he ruled that these uh, posters and were protectable and that the knockoff posters um, were infringing. So Bleistein should not be held up as an example for, um, you know, not getting involved with art, not assessing the facts around art, um, staying out of the art world. Great. And so what, what needs to happen in terms of substantial sim similarity? Can you give us a kind of sneak peek of uh, the Meyer lecture and what your paper discusses? Uh, well, I've sort of given you partially, at least, a sneak peek of my views, at least, um, it, as they apply to the visual art world um, and substantial similarity and the importance of doing a thorough substantial similarity evaluation. Um, I mean, the interesting thing is that the Supreme Court has never ruled on substantial similarity. Congress has never legislated substantial similarity. So everything we know about how we uh, deal with substantial similarity issues is based on what the lower courts tell us. Um, this case wasn't teed up for the Supreme Court to rule on this. There are other cases in the pipeline that would be appropriate for such a ruling. Um, uh, I agree, I think, with what Jessica was saying, uh, with Professor Littman was saying that, um, you know, the best result would be for the uh, court to remand to the Southern District for further proceedings, beginning with the full consideration of substantial similarity. But I also think that's highly unlikely to happen. Um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, a preview of my paper, my paper discusses why performing a meaningful threshold uh, substantial similarity analysis in any um, determination, uh, sub whether it's uh, you know summary judgment um, or or otherwise uh, that's dispositive, um, uh, it, uh, it, it is important um, and is cons is consistent with the constitutional incentive for copyright. Um, and would lead to more logical outcomes in cases, particularly where you're trying to draw these distinct distinctions between derivative and transformative uses. Um, and I do so by talking about cases like Bleistein and, uh, and Sarney, um, and, uh, and I focus mostly on visual arts cases, so. Great. Uh, thanks, Professor. Now, a couple of questions from the Q&A, if you could put these maybe into one answer. Bill McGrath asks, Sandra, do you think the court should dismiss on grounds that cert was improvidently granted? And Martin Bianchuso asks, what are the potential consequences that could result from a ruling in favor of either party? Uh, sorry, so I don't think they should dismiss. I think they should remand back to the Southern District um, for fresh proceedings, starting with substantial similarity. And what was, sorry, I, I don't what are think the I, yeah, what are the potential consequences that could result from a ruling in favor of either party? Uh, so I honestly just 
think that whatever ruling you try to make without a proper foundation is going to be bad for artists in general. Any global pronouncement um, that is premised on trying to shift a factual dispute up to a global you know, pronouncement in the transformative use realm is going to be unfortunate um, for artists in one way or another. Um, I, you know, as much as I would like to see Cario uh, carved back or crossed out with the big Sharpie, yeah. um, the Second Circuit didn't do it. And the problem with Cario is that it also didn't do a substantial similarity analysis to start with. So the partially, you know, the problem was relying on a case that itself had problems to begin with. Anyway, I don't have strong opinions on this issue, as you can all tell. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, thank you so much, Professor Astars. Next up, we have Professor Emily Bazzotti. Professor Bazzotti teaches at the California Western School of Law in San Diego and is the chair of the Cultural Heritage Section of the American Society of International Law, the vice chair of the International Division of the ABA's Forum on Entertainment and Sports Industries, and an executive committee member of the AALS Art Law Section. Professor Bazzotti's research and teaching interests are in the fields of art and cultural heritage law with a background in art history. Professor Bazzotti's research focuses on the interdisciplinary connection between the law and arts within a national and international framework. Her scholarship centers on the intersection of cultural heritage law, human rights, and social justice. And her published works explore the use of a cultural heritage as not only a medium of expression, but a medium of marginalization. Professor Bazzotti has explored how acts of plunder, destruction, and even sometimes the erection of objects of cultural heritage service tools of oppression and persecution. Professor Bizzotti, my biggest critique of law school is that no one talks about the race of the plaintiff and the defendant. It is assumed that the law is unbiased. So talking about plaintiff and defendant in the abstract, like mathematical variables is sufficient to discharge justice. Sometimes we even use math symbols or pi and delta instead of people's names. My explorations in these panels on, you know, for my 1L year race and IP, copyright and racial justice, 2L year cultural misappropriation, hip hop and the law, and now 3L year has been my attempt to reassert the importance of the cultural narrative of, pe narrative of people and how the law biases persons of, col of color, oftentimes when the plaintiff, plaintiff or defendant are persons of color and the law is not neutral. So professor, what insight does your work in cultural heritage, critical race theory and IP illuminate on the subject of a controversy between two white visual artists Artists over who gets to profit off of a black musician's image. Is there any reinforcement of structural racism at play here? Thank you, Jeff, for, for inviting me for this panel and, of course, asking me these critical questions. So much of my research interest intersects on post-colonial theory, CRT, lat crit, and that really converts a lot with art law, including IP. So here we don't have a BIPOC artist that's directly involved in the case, right? We don't have a, we have two white artists on both sides of the case. However, I think it's really notable that Prince is, who is a black man is really the heart of the dispute. So copyright law doesn't grant ownership of the images to anyone else when we're talking about photography other than the photographer, right? So the models don't have any copyright interest in the works for which they're being displayed. And I think that's really important that we acknowledge these cases concerning copyright and photographs, which involve BIPOC models. So those who gain no monetary value for the use of their own body when creating these works. And um, Professor Rosenblatt, uh, Elizabeth Rosenbach has argued that copyright law gives authors the power to really exploit and misrepresent the subjects who are part of that of those images. And we see examples of this in Cariou, obviously, regarding the photographs of the Rastafarian community. We see it in the Perfect 10 case um, when we're looking at fo photographs of female bodies. Um, the Morel case, we are looking at photographs of the Haitian earthquake victims. And most recently, since the, the deaths of Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, we see that numerous retail companies are also beginning to sell like clothing and apparel using the name, image, and likeness of, of these particular people. So while this is really a copyright case, it's also important to consider kind of these racial aspects as well, even though that's more really in the purview of right of publicity or trademark law broadly. 
But I think it's important for us to acknowledge it in this specific issue that we're looking at the exploitation of BIPOC people in general. And that's really where we get into the role of critical IP in, in our discussion as well. And so do you think is race relevant to copyright law outcomes? Uh, why should we talk about race here specifically and generally in law school? So I think there's a little bit of a temptation for in copyright to consider copyright kind of non-discriminatory, especially when we think about the principles of you know, non-discrimination in Bleistein. And in a sense, that might be true when we look at the Copyright Act, it's, it's facially neutral when we think about the identities of the authors and the types of works. And when we think about the incentives of copyright from the constitutional clause, right, we're also looking at really economic maximization and, and the encouragement of creation of works and, you know, the dissemination of works. So on its face, the Copyright Act is, is race neutral. But we see uh, a lot of scholars recently, specifically uh, Professor Vatz and Dean Deidre Keller, really spearheaded this theoretical inquiry called critical race IP, or we call it crit IP. And this really has emerged as a movement to focus on this theoretical framework of looking at critical race studies and the intersection with intellectual property. And this is really a good way of looking at how BIPOC authors in particular are treated under the Copyright Act. So a lot of these various scholars have identified ways in which the copyright system has promoted specific racial hierarchies. So uh, I think KJ Green was one of the, the professors have, who has identified, and I think he has uh, spoke at on one of your panels, but he's identified numerous doctrines within the Copyright Act, such as uh, I think the idea expression dichotomy, the originality threshold, fixation is something that I'm focused on in, in my scholarship, my upcoming scholarship, and the absence of moral rights is some of the, the factors that promote this racial hierarchy within copyright law. And also we see that historically, the copyright system has really permitted this a misappropriation of black artists for, for decades since the 1909 act. And so as it stands now, I will, I can say that copyright law has, is currently constructed in a way to privilege creative authors or from dominant cultures as opposed from those in emerging or marginalized communities. So I think it's important that we teach students who study copyright law and really all subjects, because I also teach property. Right, to recognize this structural racism, racism that is common not only within the laws itself, but culturally. So it's a product of our legal norms and, and we have to acknowledge it and proactively advocate against it. And I think that's our role as professors to do that. And do you see that also? I know like the Cariou case has come up a couple of times. So does, do you see that as well in Cariou? Do, do you see that as a case between two kind of cultural appropriators? So I wouldn't say that Cariou in particular is a cultural appropriator. I think there's a fine line between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation. So Cariou was uh, a professional photographer. He went to Jamaica over the course of six years. He lived with the Jamaican Rastafarians. He developed relationships with the Rastafarians. They allowed him to take these series of photos and, and photographs of him. They kind of, and he did it in a classical way in, in order to respect their culture and respect them and their, their autonomy as people. On the other hand, I think we could all agree that Prince's actions were much more, much more problematic because he altered those photographs significantly, right? And maybe, and I don't think in a, in a transformative way, but I think reasonable minds could, could differ. He didn't ask permission to do that. He definitely didn't ask permission from the Rastafarian people. And so I would say that Prince could probably could be considered both an appropriator and an expropriator here. So... I, I think carry you not really, but Prince, yes. Thank you. Now, Professor Latif Matima filed a brief for Goldsmith on behalf of the Institute for Intellectual Property and Social Justice. So which side is the social justice side in this debate? So I don't think either side is the right side for social justice. I think, again, that reasonable minds can differ, right? We can all have similar goals that there's a way to achieve social justice in copyright. And I think that we can differ on the way 
or the, uh, you know, the manner in which to achieve those goals. So I think Professor Matima's argument is really well done. I agree with a lot of what he stated in his brief, specifically about the historical record of exclusion and unjust practices within the industry and the application of copyright laws. And, and I definitely agree with him that there's this hierarchy, uh, specifically in fair use cases where you see that the doctrine has it applied for the advantage of very popular white artists like Jeff Koons and Richard Prince, right? And he cites a lot of, of really great critical IP scholars like uh, Professor Anjali, Professor Rosenblatt, KJ Green, um, as I said before. I think the problem is that to the transformative use doctrine is not what I think is really where the heart of the social justice issues is with IP. I think it really comes from the constitutional mandate and what we consider progress. So progress has really been recently more about economic maxim maximization and these utilitarian goals. And so I think it's really what we consider to be progress. And I think social justice and equity should be part of that meaning and how we define and interpret what progress is. So I agree with a lot of what Professor Matima stated in his, in his brief, but I don't necessarily think that making the transformative doctrine stricter, right, is going to be the means to achieve more social justice in IP. Thank you so much, Professor. Now, jumping off from the social justice topic to the Q&A, I notice here that uh, my <laughs> faculty advisor is, is asked a question, so I feel remiss, I, I must uh, say it. Nikki Kukas asks, can you really separate the commercial licensing of Andy Warhol's image from the creation of that image? If he had a fair use right to create the original image, doesn't he also have a right to commercially license his own work? And conversely, if his image was illegally created, surely he will not have the right uh, surely he will not have the right to license it. In either case, isn't the real question whether the original Warhol artwork was or was not a fair use? It's at 6.28 p.m. if one of the panelists are looking for it. So uh, I'll jump in and say- Oh, sure, sure. My view is that you cannot separate the two and that it, how how would an artist judge what they can do in their studio practice if they had to somehow speculate out what somebody down the road after their death would do upon inheriting the work and whether that licensing practice would somehow be legal, illegal. I mean, it, I, I understand the I understand on one level the logic of saying, yes, we look at uses, use by use, but you have to think about when the work is created and what is in the artist's mind in thinking about how the artist is going to do the right thing as a in accordance with copyright law, right? Because uh, if the artist is thinking about copyright law at all when creating a work, let's presume that they are, uh, um, you know, you, you're, you're, um, they're thinking about it when they're creating, not you know, not trying to speculate out what somebody somewhere down the line is going to do with the work, right? And the licensing entity, on the other hand, or the gallery exhibiting the work inherits whatever rights the artist had to give away. You don't have, you don't get any more or any less rights than the artist has to grant you. I, I, I don't know, Jordan. I will, yeah, I'll respectfully disagree. Where that, where that disagree, where that opinion comes from, because I don't understand where the... Sure, yeah. Well, I think um, this is one of the, the um, factual mysteries in this case, because Andy Warhol died before we could get any information from him about what his intention was when he created these other works. We know that at least um, Purple Prince was created pursuant to a license, but we just don't know why the others were created. Maybe they were practice pieces to work on his technique, in which case they could very well be fair uses. Um, what we do know though, is that in his lifetime, he never sought to commercialize them. So, um, you know, we, we don't know what 
we don't know for sure. Um, but it, it was only after his death that, you know, his his heirs uh, were the were the ones who entered into this commercial license. So I, I you know, I, I agree with you that it's it's uh, if possible, you can learn a lot um, based on uh, facts that you can um, obtain during discovery about what the uh, what the creator's intention was. It's just not possible here. Um, it, it is very possible that for certain types of uses, and there's lots of cases that show this, that the same work um, uh, is evaluated differently based on how it's used. There's a the recent Nicki Minaj case where the court found that her, her creation of the um, new version of Fast Car itself was a fair use but the uh, distribution of it was not a fair use. So um, I, I think that courts can and, and have and can uh, make informed, uh, reach informed conclusions um, looking specifically at the specific use. Thank you so much. And uh, our final panelist tonight is Professor Pamela Samuelson. Professor Samuelson is the Richard Sherman Distinguished Professor of Law and Information at the University of California, Berkeley and director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. She's recognized as a pioneer in digital copyright law, intellectual property, cyber law, and information policy. She's co-founder and chair of the Board of Authors Alliance, a nonprofit organization that promotes the public interest in access to knowledge. She also serves on the board of directors of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Electronic Privacy Information Center. Professor Samuelson has written and published extensively in the areas of copyright, software protection, and cyber law. Professor Samuelson, you've seen it all. What should the Supreme Court do here? Is it as easy as meaning and message are relevant, reverse and remand? Can they even affirm if no other factors have been briefed? I don't think that they can affirm um, uh, the, the entire fair use ruling, um, even though uh, the government's lawyer actually argued that. Um, I think at least two of the justices said, but the other factors weren't um, uh, weren't even briefed to us. Uh, so I don't think they can even decide um, the purpose of the use. Uh, the only thing before the court uh, is the question presented um, uh, as they uh, granted cert. Um, and as to that uh, question, uh, was Andy Warhol's uh, creation of the Prince uh, work um, uh, transformative? Second Circuit says not transformative at all um, and treats actually transformation as an all or nothing thing. Um, and one of the things that the Authors Alliance brief uh, tried to say, um, and here is one of the few places where we agree with the government, um, uh, is that it's a matter of degree. Um, right. Sometimes some some things are modestly transformative. Some things are highly transformative. Some things are just transformative. Um, and um, uh, the Second Circuit, by just saying not transformative and you can't consider any meaning and you have to decide it at this kind of really high level of generality. Right. At a really high level of generality uh, in Campbell, they were both songs about women walk on the streets. OK. Um, um, popular music. Um, and yet. Um, uh, this kind of notion that you just gotta go way up there uh, at the ceiling. So I think, again, the case was partly a, an overreaction uh, to the district court not having done its homework. I agree with Sandra that it's like ridiculous that they didn't even try to talk about um, uh, the substantial similarity issue. Uh, and I know Karis Craig actually wrote an article saying, these two things aren't substantially similar at all. Um, and there was a, before the Second Circuit um, the, on the first time that they uh, issued an opinion, a brief of some cop copyright scholars and saying, it's not even substantially similar. If it's not substantially similar, if it's not at least a prima facie infringement of the reproduction or the derivative work, right? You don't get to fair use, right? Um, and so that's one of the things that's very frustrating. Uh, about the about the case is that um, it's really not the greatest vehicle. Um, on the other hand, uh, the simplest thing for the court to do uh, is to say, trans we've said twice 
And uh, we're going to believe in stare decisis today um, uh, that uh, uh, a new meaning or message is actually a sign of whether something's transformative or not. Um, so yes, this is, uh, this is the Warhol work is uh, transformative um, in the sense that it has some new meaning or message, but uh, don't give too much weight to that one consideration. You have to weigh the factors all together. And so remand for, um, uh, for further proceedings. If that's what the court does, um, I think many of us will go Shh, um, and, um, uh, and leave this for, uh, for another day. But it, it does seem to me that, um, uh, that the court um, has an easy out here, um, just as it had an easy out uh, in the in the Google versus Oracle case, you had a jury verdict, right, of fair use, um, and it took a couple of weeks for that case to go to go through court. Had lots and lots of facts in it, um, and uh, a jury said it's fair use, and then the Oracle says, "Oh no, no reasonable jury could have decided that." Um, and um, actually, uh, one of the things that the that even though the court in the Google opinion talks about, oh, fair use is mostly a, an issue of uh, of law. Um, it's got some facts, but but the court kept weaving all the facts that were in the record um, that supported uh, the the Google Fair Use defense. Uh, so you know uh, this kind of what is a fact and what is law. I think part of what's going on in cases like this um, is that. Everybody wants to cross move for summary judgment um, and fair use is the easiest one to sort of do that because then you get to do the balancing thing. Um, and it seems to me that, um, uh, again, I agree with Sandra, that is like um, not, not, a, not a record here. And, you know, the Second Circuit basically spouted lots of different uh, tests. So part of what I would say the, the main reason the Authors Alliance put uh, a brief in was because we thought that the Second Circuit opinion would cause much more um, confusion in the law than it would provide clarity. So um, uh, one point that says it has to be uh, recognizably similar, if it's recognizably similar, then it can't be transformative. Uh, then it says, oh, you know, you have to take into account the over overarching purpose or function. It's like, I don't even know what that means, okay? Um, uh, and uh, and we give some examples of types of uses that nonfiction authors uh, make of, um, uh, of protected works when they're commenting, right? Writing a book about so, 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 such and such person. Um, and then the, the second circuit also talks about it has to have a distinct artistic purpose, like how do I know that? Um, and we can't consider a meaning or message at all. Um, and judges can't make these kind of ju judgments. Like, come on, okay? People have been doing it since 1994, and uh, you're the only people who've been having a problem here. Um, now, the you know, again, part of what the court didn't do is sort of say, you know, here are the reasons why um, uh, these other factors uh, might outweigh. Right? I think nobody would have gone um, baloney crazy on this case um, if it, if they just said. It's transformative, but the other factors outweigh. And now I would have disagreed with that, but but at least that would have been uh, a respectable thing to say. I think one of the other things that's about there are two other things that I want to mention about the uh, about the um, about the Second Circuit opinion is that it doesn't even acknowledge that Warhol was given this photograph to use as an artist reference. Vanity Fair commissioned um, him to make a transformative work of art from the photograph to illustrate what fame does to somebody. Um, and the photograph was taken before he was really famous. It was like, um, but he was kind of on the rise. And of course, then he became uh, this incredible icon. Um, but the, you know, the, 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 the court doesn't even say anything about it. Now it doesn't say, Oh, and it, was, it, was, it wasn't transformative, it, was, it wasn't fair use. It's like, I'm sorry, he was commissioned to do this, okay? And she got paid for that. Um, and so I haven't been able to understand why um, the Second Circuit doesn't realize that there's at least one uh, and possibly multiple derivative works that were authorized um, and once it's authorized, then you own the copyright in it. Um, if it was lawfully made, then you can sell it, sell the work to somebody else, distribute a copy, uh, and you can publicly display it. Um, 
you know, can you commercially license it? I don't see any case that's ever been uh, really litigated where that's where a, an artist was commissioned to create a work of art. They did it. Um, the work was uh, uh, was there. And, you know, he wasn't he wasn't Warhol was not a party to the to the license um, that uh, Vanity Fair entered into with Goldsmith's um, uh, Goldsmith agent. And there's no evidence in the record that he knew anything about uh, the restriction that that Goldsmith is really uh, relying on. So those are kind of weird things. And then the last thing I'll, I'll say, because um, I'm all wound up, um, uh, is, um, uh, is that the Second Circuit tried to create this kind of like uh, Solomonic compromise, not uh, substantially similar, uh, not fair use, but um, we don't have to issue an injunction. And, you know, if the, if the, if the, if the, if the Warhol Foundation wants to sort of make a book about uh, Warhol and use some of those things, that, that'll be okay. Not, 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 just not the commercial license to the magazine. It's like, um, and uh, the parts of the, the, the opinion say, oh, it, you know, it may be a, a, an infringing derivative, but we're not deciding that. It's like, I'm sorry, if it's an infringing derivative, the Second Circuit didn't realize that Section 103A would mean that the Warhol Foundation's copyrights would be totally dead. Now, from the standpoint of the, of the Warhol Foundation, the government's position, however, I'm not going to go there right now. Um, um, uh, whatever other uh, characteristics one might say about it, um, uh, they at least would uh, not challenge the 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 the, uh, the copyright. But that's what the that's what the parties are litigating about. Okay, Goldsmith uh, Goldsmith claim um, in the counterclaim is that the that all sixteen work, works are infringing derivatives, and Warhol says they were. They were fair use when they were created. So the fact that the government's trying to change what the question presented is, is like really weird. Um, there, I'm done with my rant. Okay. I, I want to mention that sure, sure. in Goldsmith's counterclaim, she is seeking a declaration that uh, the Warhol Foundation owns no copyrights in the works because they were created in violation of 103 and an injunction preventing the foundation from publicly displaying any of the uh, works of art in the print series. So once the Second Circuit says this is substantially similar as a matter of law, it's hard to know how you go back down and say, oh, but the district court has got the discretion uh, to uh, not offer that relief. It happens automatically, right? Upon the finding of infringing derivative, poof, the copyrights disappear. There. So you mentioned Google v. Oracle. I just wanted to clarify. Some say that Google v. Oracle is irrelevant in the context of the visual arts. Are they right or is Google relevant here? Um, well, Justice Breyer managed to, uh, to slip in um, um, a reference to Andy Warhol and the, and the soup cans um, painting. So um, there is that. Um, uh, but also Campbell uh, is repeatedly uh, drawn upon and Campbell has been used in every kind of, uh, of uh, fair use case out there. Now, the people who uh, wanna say, oh, Google versus Oracle, that's just a software case are people who were trying to get the Supreme Court to affirm the Federal Circuit's not fair use um, in the in the Google case. Uh, so yeah, I mean, they wanted they wanted the, the the Supreme Court to give fair use a haircut in the Google versus Oracle case. It didn't work. So now you got to say, hey, but that's only a software case. Um, well, it's not. And how about? Um... What role does Warhol's fame play in this case? That's come up a bit. You know, is the celebrity plagiarist argument clever or aggravating? Totally aggravating. Um, um, now, I'm not saying that there, are, there aren't going to be uh, issues arising. Um, some people would say that's what the Gary versus Prince case was about. Um, uh, but um, I, I think this is uh, 
uh, is a case where because he was commissioned to make a transformative work of art from the photograph, it's not celebrity plagiarism when you're commissioned under a license to do something like this. So going off that, is, is Vanity Fair the proper defendant in this case? Why, why is it significant that Warhol and Goldsmith were not in privity and that there's no evidence that Warhol knew about the artist's reference? If you could just flesh that out a little. Well, the way that contract law works is that the contract binds the two parties to the contract. And if you're not party to the contract um, and you don't have knowledge of a restriction in a contract over here when you are asked to create a work over here. You can't be bound by something that you didn't enter into. So there's that. Um, uh, but I think the, you know, the issue uh, about the uh, celebrities and plagiarism, um, I think, you know, the Carey decision partly um, aggravates some people because the you know, it was the glitterati of the, you know, oh, the cool people. Um, and um, you can see that the, that the, the, the Second Circuit panel just like, ew, ew, ew. Just look it down on, uh, on, on Warhol. And, uh, you know, I mean, Lisa Blatt's a very good lawyer and the kind of celebrity plagiarist line uh, or meme was like really clever. Um, but uh, I think it's a bunch of baloney in the context of this case. Mm. And is the is the government right about the uh, necessary or highly useful standard, or is or, you know is the standard reasonable in light of your purpose? Um, and reasonable also in light of your purpose, they keep saying that, um, and that's what the courts have been holding. Um, so um, I understand. Lots of people would like to give fair use a haircut, as Jessica said uh, at the outset. Everybody every year says fair use has gone too far. Um, and then it keeps going. Um, and, you know, I don't say that I agree with every single opinion out there. But again, I think the Second Circuit in the in the Kerry case was partly a, uh, um, influenced by uh, the trial court was going to seize all of the paintings and were going to destroy them. And so a Second Circuit oral argument that was likened to the kind of the 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 destruction uh, by the Taliban of the Bamiyan uh, Buddha um, and you know the idea that um, you know maybe they should have to pay something but uh, the court basically I think was reacting to that so if Kerry went a little bit too far this way I think the 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 Goldsmith court went mm, uh, in the other direction and so maybe everybody should just calm down so. Um, you've written that un unless carefully cabined to the kinds of foreseeable markets exemplified by the definitional derivatives, this right can unduly restrain competition and follow on innovation as well as interfere with free expression interests of subsequent creators. So why does the text, legislative hist history, and constitutional purpose cabin the reach of the derivative work right? Do you think Warhol's prints is similar enough in characteristics to the nine exemplary, exemplary derivatives to be a close analog fairly within the scope of the derivative work right? Well, I think one of the reasons why this case has got, gotten so much attention is that, that the line between the kind of transforming, transformative derivative work that you should have gotten licensed for and a transformative fair use, that line has always been a little on the blurry side. Um, and this case, the, again, depending on how you look at it, um, some people see it on this side and some people see it uh, on that side. Um, uh, like Sandra, I would have liked to see it a, a better record um, uh, on this uh, case. And I think the, the district court um, both skipped over the, the kind of prima facie issue uh, uh, and got too quickly to, hey, it's transformative there if I can get rid of this case. Um, uh, and um, I think the, the, the thing is that the... Um, there's a kind of unfairness thing underlying this whole case too, which is she only got paid $400 in 1984 and they made $10,000 when they sent that. Um, but you know, she actually came to the Warhol Foundation and basically said, I want seven figures uh, of, of damages from you. Um, and you know, I own all the copyrights and all of those works. And it's like, excuse me, um, uh, 
maybe I think that they they aren't. So I think this this case again, depending on who's looking at it, um, illustrates that that line. Uh, for me personally, um, if I was a judge on uh, on the Second Circuit panel, I would have said it's transformative, um, and you know I would want to have a little, a little bit more of the facts uh, on the ground, but. Um, but I think it was transformative when it was created. And again, for me, that extra little tipping thing uh, is that he made it under a license. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the Schrock case, for example, says that a derivative work that has been created under a license has a separate copyright, separate copyright, and they can sue uh, for infringement. Um, and I think exercise their copyrights. Uh, so I'm, I'm more, I think, again, with Sandra on, you know, you get something that's a lawfully made work um, and it's got originality in it, um, enough originality to support a copyright. I don't see why um, uh, why they can't uh, commercialize it. But then, uh, you know, we have just different points of view here. That's part of the reason this case is so much fun. And and lastly, you know, when when the, when the Constitution says that copyright's goal is progress of the arts, you know, is it talking about public access to knowledge? Just came up a lot in the briefs. I was I was combing them, and they said the purpose of copyright is to promote the ongoing creation and dissemination of knowledge, to stimulate artistic creati creativity for the general public good. But then also from the other side, they said that the goal is ensuring that creators are given adequate monetary incentive to create. The goal of copyright is to promote creators' further speech and so on and so forth. So how do you see the the, the meaning of that uh, um, uh, in the Constitution, the, those words, that progress of the arts? Well, one thing you see is the Supreme Court, at least not, not in Justice Ginsburg's um, uh, opinions, but in uh, other opinions, including um, the Google versus Oracle case, you see the court having articulated uh, that uh, rewarding authors is a secondary consideration, that the overall purpose of copyright is actually to promote the public good uh, and to do so by uh, encouraging the creation and dissemination of works uh, of authorship. So the, um, the court has, you know, repeats itself about that particular formulation uh, going back to the 1940s. And so it's been carried through on a number of the uh, Supreme Court opinions. And so at least some of the justices, I think, have this higher purpose uh, in mind, which isn't to say that um, that that's a, a license for anybody to say, oh, well, I'm just I'm just adding to uh, the store of knowledge and therefore um, everything I do with your work is is fair use. Um, I don't think that's the, I don't think that's what anybody thinks. Uh, but again, fair use has been a kind of battleground uh, for copyright uh, for decades. Um, and, you know, the Supreme Court split four to four um, in uh, uh, in one of the other uh fair use cases uh, decided uh, before the 76 Act became effective. Um, so they, you know, and it was 5-4 in the Sony case. And um, so it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's been a battleground for a long time. Mm. Thank you so much, Professor Samuelson. We have uh, five minutes for Q&A. So, uh, and, oh, I should also say, I saw um, maybe Professor Bazzotti raised her hand. Would you like to say anything? Or if any panelists have some responses to any of these, you, you're welcome to or we could go to a, oh yeah, Professor A. you raise your hand, go ahead. I just wanted to say one thing um, that uh, Pam's comments made me think of, um, and that is, this is such an interesting case to me because um, it's a fair use case involving two artists' uh, interests at heart, right? And the expressive use of artistic works between two artists, not the work of an artist being exploited by a third party, used by a third party in a different manner to promote a different business. And so I think it's uh, it's a great case for us to think about those core purposes of the of the Copyright Act. And when you asked Pam and you read off those uh, the various purposes that the Copyright Act is supposed to serve um, and the the constitutional purposes of copyright, my answer was yes, all of those, right? Um, and I hope you agree with me, Pam. Sure. Yeah, so, and I think this is the case where all of us can say yes, all of those, and let's figure out how those get sorted. And I think the reason why, I, and I think actually probably the reason why Pam and I are agreeing on this is because there are 
two artists involved, and we both care about the fact that artists are allowed to control the commercial exploitation of their speech and expression, but also build on the expression of others. That is a, that's one of the core goals of the Copyright Act, and that's what that's what we're struggling with here, and that's why we need a good record to do it. Thanks, Professor. Professor Levin. Um, I just wanted to say that in some ways we have a new court uh, that over the years, Justices Ginsburg, Scalia and Breyer had very distinctive and I think well-known approaches to copyright law to the point where if you were a court watcher, you could almost draft the uh, opinion yourself after oral argument with all of their voices no longer on the court, um, it's really interesting to see which of the justices will persuade each other to sign on to a particular approach. I'm not confident that they'll get into conference and say, let's do something that would be maximally helpful uh, rather than arguing about who's right, but it's more possible in some sense, because we don't really know what to expect. Great. And because uh, I'm a musician, I, I liked the, this question from Judith Fennell. In music cases like Campbell, would the transformative analysis be entirely different or at least more difficult if the music had contained no lyrics to cite? And had been the only, and had been only based on melodic pitch, harmony, and other compositional elements. Anyone want to chime in on a music question? I'm not a musician, but I think the analysis might go the same way as we might analyze my red squares, right? We look at whatever factual information and extrinsic information we can gather uh, to build our to build our record. Um, Great. Any any other final comments on this from any of the panelists? Um, on this question or on any any other last last chance on transformative fair use last words no okay great thank you uh, so much to all the panelists thank you all for attending and again uh, if you'd like a recording of tonight's webinar please email me at ipla at g.rwu.edu thank you again to the copyright society thank you so much sorry for the technical difficulties at the beginning i think we pulled it through <laughs> and uh and good thank night you all. Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. That was really a uh, really a fun fun thing to do, and uh, you did a masterful job as a as our moderator. Thank you so much, Professor. Yeah, well done.